All right, I was not going to make a video for this, but by popular demand, here's one more for you. All right, so, so uh, recently we've been working on indefinite integrals. This video will just kind of serve as a brief introduction to definite integrals. So let's kind of jump right into it. All right, so this is basically the general format of what we've been dealing with. This down here, that's the indefinite integral. Okay, and the way we've been solving those, we've been using all of our rules of integration. Those are kind of old news to us. If capital F of X is just the general antiderivative of the integral of F of X dx, and then we make sure to add on our plus C, our constant of integration. Okay, that's what we've been doing past few weeks. Okay, so the difference here right away off the bat with this definite integral up here, I'm sure you can notice, is we have these things here, that A and B. Those are what are called the limits of integration. Okay, and I know people get confused and there's a lot of letters involved. Those will mostly be numbers, so don't worry too much about it. Basically, those are the values that we are um, going to be evaluating our integral under. So the way we're gonna actually evaluate these, these definite integrals, the first step is going to be find the antiderivative, okay? And then we're just going to evaluate that antiderivative at those values a and b where it's going to look like this we're just going to plug in b so f of b and subtract out f of a okay so at the end of the day here you should end up with a number for a definite integral for indefinite and i realize i've spelled indefinite wrong but an indefinite integral you end up with a function Okay, so that's the main difference. The rules still work most of the same. Okay, it's just kind of an adding that extra step of plugging in at the end there. Okay, it's kind of formalizing uh, what I just said on the last slide. Okay, this is actually so important in calculus. They call this the fundamental theorem of calculus, or at least a part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. As long as our function f is continuous on the interval, a to B, a closed interval A to B. And F, the capital F, is just any function that satisfies F prime of X equals F of X. It's basically just saying that capital F of X is the antiderivative of lowercase f of X. This is just defining that definite integral. A to B of F of X dx just equals F of B minus F of A. Okay, so so vital. It's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, and basically, you know, back in derivatives where we were kind of given a uh, good interpretation of what a derivative was, rate of change, um, the slope of the line, tangent to the curve. Um, we're going to have the same thing for definite integrals. We'll go into more detail later on, but it's good just kind of have this in your back pocket. If we have some function f of x, okay, what we're getting here when we integrate from a to b, if those are our values of a to b, and that's our function f of x, what this definite integral will give us, it'll give us that net area between the curve and the x-axis, okay? So just something to keep track of, keep tabs on going forward. Um, it's not gonna be the focus of this um, video, but it's what we'll be doing going forward. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, so let's just do this first example, um, putting some numbers into it and just kind of show you how it works. All right, so the first step here is just going to be find the antiderivative just like we normally did. Okay, so if we were just to have this normal problem back in the day of 2x dx, all right, the indefinite integral, using that reverse power rule that we talked about, add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, this will just give us x squared, plus c. 
All right, so I'll keep the C around for now just to make you guys aware about why going forward we actually don't need to worry about it for definite integrals. So now that I have that x squared plus C, I'm going to evaluate it from x equals 1 to x equals 2. All that big bar means that I drew there, that is just saying that we're about to plug in those numbers. So I'm going to plug in x equals 2. So that's going to be, whoops. little typo there. So that's just going to be 2 squared plus c. And then I'm going to plug in 1. 1 squared plus c. All right, so notice right away the c's will cancel out. And that will happen any every time. So going forward, you do not need to worry about the plus c for definite integrals. For indefinite integrals, you definitely still do. But then we're just evaluating and getting this number. So 4 squared, I'm sorry, 2 squared is 4 minus 1 squared, which is 1. So we end up with 3. And that's the answer. Okay, just thinking back to what I was saying about that net area. Okay, so taking the function 2x, which is just line going through the origin slope of 2. And thinking about that region from 1 to 2. This area shaded in the green is 3. Okay, so that's what that means. We'll be using that interpretation more often going forward. Let's jump to this next example. Okay, adding it adding a term here. So now we have x squared plus 1, um, but still not too difficult. So the first step is just using our rules of integration to kind of integrate the function. So this first term, that x squared, that'll just be 1 third x cubed plus x. And I'm going to be evaluating that from 0 to 2. So I just need to plug in two. Sorry, extra parentheses here, and then tracked out when I plug in zero. Okay, so for a lot of these problems, there's a lot of opportunities for mistakes in this step when you're just plugging in the numbers. This should hopefully be the easy part. So just take your times, keep in take your time, keep in mind the order of operations. Okay, be very careful with your positives and your negatives, all of that. Um, because up here is, is the calculus part. If you, if you get the whole integral right, you want to make sure that you get the steps right where you're just plugging in the numbers. So 1 third times 2 cubed, which is 8, plus 2. This whole thing is going to be 0, because we have 0 cubed plus 0, so that's just 0. So we have 8 thirds plus 2 minus 0, or 8 thirds plus 6 thirds, which equals 14 thirds. All right, just to keep the, uh, the pattern going of showing you kind of the interpretation here. x squared plus 1, just a standard parabola, moved up 1. What we just evaluated here, we took the integral from, oops, not from 1, we took it from 0. So the integral from 1, I'm sorry, from 0 to 2, that area is 14 thirds. Beautiful. So going into some properties here, okay, um, good things to know. We had a lot of these already for indefinite integrals, and we're just seeing that they still apply for definite integrals. This first one, the sum or difference. Okay, we know if we have multiple functions separated by addition subtraction, we can treat those separately and just uh, um, find the definite integral of each separately and then combine the answer. Um, notice there's no rule for multiplication or division like that, um, just like there wasn't for indefinite integrals. So don't try and do that. For constant multiples, 
Okay, we know this was very similar to what we had for indefinite integrals. If you have a constant coefficient inside there, you can pull it out. This might make your work somewhat easier if you can just evaluate this integral and then multiply it uh, by that constant afterwards, if k is just any constant. This third one is new, so it's called the reverse interval rule. If you reverse your limits of integration, so here we're going from a to b, here we're going from b to a, your answer is just going to be the same thing you got over here, just multiplied by negative 1. So just for example, if, you, if your answer for from 0 to 2 of f of x dx, if that equaled 3, if you did that same function from 2 to 0, just flipping those limits of integration, this will equal negative 3. All right. Uh, the fourth rule here, zero length interval, if you have the same limits of an integration, okay, that integral, the definite integral will equal zero. That makes sense, especially when you're thinking about the kind of area interpretation. If you have no region, the area is going to equal zero. So anytime, no matter how complicated the function is, anytime you have the same number here and here, that integral is going to equal zero. And then this last one. Okay, it just kind of allows us to, to split up um, the intervals, and that's going to be kind of more helpful to us when we're trying to find uh, total area or areas between curves. So we'll, we'll kind of hold off on that one, but that, that is going to be quite useful to, to us going forward. Okay, just some quick examples of using those properties. Um, this first one, so we have 21 sine cubed of 4x minus 11 dx. There may be some slight panic going on here. It looks like a complicated integral, but if you take a look here, just going from one to one, okay, that's that uh, zero length interval. Um, so it doesn't matter what the function is, the answer is always going to be zero. It requires no more work than that, okay? You don't need to actually evaluate the integral because we know if it's going from one to one, it's just going to equal zero. Easy as that. Okay, for these next two, we're going to use the fact that we already evaluated the integral x squared plus 1 from 0 to 2. Okay, and we know that from a few slides ago, that was 14 thirds. So we're going to use that information to our advantage here. Um, so we notice this middle one here. That's just flipping the limits of integration from what we had up here. So here we had 0 to 2. This is just 2 to 0. Okay. If from 0 to 2, our answer was 14 thirds. From 2 to 0, our answer will just be negative 14 thirds. Reversing those limits of integration just gets you the negative answer. Okay. Down here, this third one. Um, we notice that what we have inside the integral, our actual function, is just double what we had here. So I can kind of rewrite this as 2 times the integral from 0 to 2 of x squared plus 1 dx. Okay, this is just that constant multiple. I can pull it out front. I know what the answer to this definite integral is that I've just boxed there in red. I know that equals 14 thirds. So this whole thing together is just going to be 2 times 14 thirds, which equals 28 thirds. Okay, so those were just a few examples of how you can use those properties to, to your advantage to kind of save you some, some time, effort, and heartache uh, on some of these examples here. All right, last one we're going to do in this video in the efforts to keep it short, just kind of adding a little bit more complexity, but really showing you that these are not that bad. Um, there's only possible mistakes to be made when you are kind of plugging in numbers, um, at least for these basic ones. So first step here is just integrate. So that first one using reverse power rule, just be x cubed minus x squared plus x. 
and then I'm going to be evaluating that from one to two. So I'm just going to plug in two here. And then plug in one. Okay. Uh, luckily, this one we avoided fractions, but that's not going to be the case a lot of the time. So hopefully you can get pretty familiar and comfortable working with fractions if you're not already. So 2 cubed is 8, minus 2 squared is 4, plus 2, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. So just... So over here, 8 minus 4 plus 2 is going to be 6. 1 minus 1 is 0, plus 1. So minus 1 equals 5. Make sure you're remembering this is always subtraction in the middle there. So if you're subtracting a negative, make sure you use all the correct uh, signs. Don't screw that up in your work. But the answer here will be 5.